we've hammered in the importance of this refrigeration cycle, but just as important as the refrigeration cycle is the refrigerant itself. Remember that refrigerant changing state from a liquid vapor, absorbing heat. Then we superheat it back to the compressor, desuperheat it, make it change state from a vapor back to a liquid, then we subcool that liquid. That is so important, that change of state, the latent heat of that refrigerant is essential. I'm still getting emails, I'm still getting people asking me, what should my pressures be? And I, I, I don't care about what your pressures are going to be. I don't know if I can stress that enough. So a lot of people get so hung up on pressures, they think that all these refrigerants work the same. Every refrigerant has that saturated temperature. So we get that pressure, convert it to a saturated temperature where it's boiling at. And they wanna make sure it's superheated coming out of the evaporator coil and subcooled coming out of that condensing coil. That's what's gonna be important. But even at different pressures and saturations, different refrigerants absorb and reject different volumes of heat. Also, these different refrigerants have different weights. Their specific gravity is gonna be different. So just because I have a refrigerant that has a pressure that you like, doesn't mean it's gonna be absorbing the correct amount of heat. And different refrigerants have different weights, so it's gonna affect how much volume is going through that compressor. The volumetric efficiency, the size difference of a 410A and R22 compressor is quite different. Even though we have the same exact saturated temperature and condensing temperature for a set of conditions, they design it that way by the meter device matching the compressor, how much volume that compressor is moving. I'll put a link in the video again talking about the difference in a compressor between R22 and 410A, but this video we're going to start out talking about with CFC R12. So that refrigerant 12, CFC chlorofluorocarbon. Notice there's two C's in there. Anytime there's two C's in a refrigerant, one of those C's is going to be a chloro. And that chloro is going to be the key of this video. So the refrigerant that was so popular was R12. We use this in refrigeration systems and also in cars. Cars had the R12 and it was a great refrigerant. So in those systems, it would absorb heat, boiling from a liquid to vapor and reject heat going from a vapor back into a liquid. It was a great refrigerant, it was a single molecule refrigerant. The problem is they found out that this refrigerant would leak out or people would vent it and this refrigerant would end up in the atmosphere. And when it ended up in the atmosphere, the UV rays from the sun would break the refrigerant down. And because of the CFC, it broke apart very easily and that chlorine molecule would be free. Well, that one molecule of chlorine destroys 100,000 molecules of ozone. And ozone, which is three oxygen molecules, is what protects us from the UV rays from the sun. Now, that's EPA test questions. One molecule of chlorine is going to destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. It doesn't stop there. As that cycle continues, it ends up coming back down to the earth level, and it creates ozone at a lower earth level. So we end up with ozone, and ozone is also called smog. So the EPA says ozone is good up high and bad nearby. So the chlorine molecule is the key. Now it's different from the chlorine that naturally occurs, such as volcanoes and these sorts of things. The, one of the differences that they found is the rise of fluorine in the atmosphere also matches the rise of chlorine in the atmosphere. So there's naturally occurring chlorine, but there's also man-made chlorine. And since it's a chlorofluorocarbon, the fluorine levels in the atmosphere match the rise of chlorine in the atmosphere, and they tied it down to R12. So in 1987, 137 countries came together and signed the Montreal Protocol. And they said, we're going to do away with CFC refrigerants first because they were the most harmful. So it was ozone depleting, ODP, ozone depletion potential. So that's refrigerant was the first one to do away with. And it was a great refrigerant, but we started doing away with this about 1993 or so. Smuggling this refrigerant from Mexico into the US was bigger than drug smuggling at the time. It's in jail for smuggling refrigerant across the border because they were making so much money. It was a pretty quick turnaround from 1987 to 1993. I should can't remember the exact year. So it was a big change. So imagine all of the vehicles having R12 and they changed over to different refrigerant. All of the refrigeration equipment having to change to a different refrigerant because of the ozone depletion potential. So that destruction of the ozone layer was an issue. Now they found out that since they've reduced and stopped using this much refrigerant and the CFC type refrigerants, they ended up seeing that the ozone layer was starting to heal itself. Now please don't attack me for any of these facts or stuff. Look up the information on your own, make your own opinions. These are preparing you for what you're gonna have on the EPA test. I'm not gonna get drug into any kind of arguments on that. Now, while we're talking about that, most automotive, most cars are going to use some kind of a compressor like this, a belt-driven compressor. So the pump, the pump action that's pumping refrigerant is in this side. But instead of having a motor inside, the motor from the engine is going to be turning the belt. 
the AC is turned on and off by a clutch. So you send 12 volts to the clutch. The clutch energizes and engages this belt into the pump action. So you may hear a that's the sound of this clutch activating and deactivating. And so as the clutch activates, it connects the turning pulley from the belt to the pump action. So it's making the refrigeration cycle start and the refrigeration cycle stop. It's still the easiest part of the refrigeration system to identify. On the EPA test, there's also gonna be a question about a shaft seal compressor. And this is a perfect example of a shaft seal compressor. So we have the compressor here, and there's a shaft running outside of the compressor. And then here we have where belts are gonna be, or it could be some other motor. But that shaft seal is notorious for leaking, especially when it's sitting, when it's not being used. The oils would cause that seal to dry out, and as the oils dried out, it would start leaking. In the old days with all of our R12 on the cars, a lot of times in the summer, we'd have to go in and recharge the system because them not being used during the winter months, the shaft still would start to dry out, the oil would sink to the bottom, and it would allow refrigerant to leak out. You may notice on newer cars that even in the winter time, you'll see the compressor engage and disengage. There's several reasons for that, but one of those reasons is to keep that shaft turning so we keep the oil moving so that we keep that shaft seal from drying out so that we don't have those leaks. So the R12 was a great refrigerant. A lot of people love this refrigerant. It was a single molecule refrigerant, absorbed heat really well, rejected heat really well, and the key is it worked with mineral or alkabenzylene oil. That mineral oil was a fantastic oil. It was very tough. It was robust. It was a good quality oil. So the oil was able to get away with a lot. Now we still were supposed to braze with nitrogen. We we're still supposed to purge it. We we're still supposed to do all these other aspects, pull a good vacuum, but a lot of people didn't and they would cut corners and the oil was robust. So it would get away with it. But as we did away with this R12 refrigerant, CFC, chlorofluorocarbon refrigerants, we replaced these with other refrigerants. And the refrigerant we replaced these with is R134A. Whether it being commercial systems or also being automotive systems, the replacement refrigerant was an R134A. So that 134A is a decent refrigerant. It wasn't quite as efficient as R22, but they designed systems with larger condensing cools, larger evaporator cools. They designed the systems to work. And now my vehicle that was designed with R134A cools better than my first vehicle did with R12. But it's not just that the refrigerant's better, it's that they designed the whole system to work better. So some of the systems that were first retrofitted from R12 over to R134A didn't work as well because they weren't designed for this refrigerant. It would still work, it just didn't typically work as well. The big issue with changing to this refrigerant was the oil. It didn't work with the mineral oil and the alkabenzylene oil. So this oil had to be replaced, it had to be removed from the system and we replaced it with this oil, which is a PAG oil. And PAG was P-A-G and it stood for polyacylene glycol. So this oil was key to be used with this refrigerant. So you had to take the systems that had R12 and you had to flush out the mineral oil and then replace it with the correct amount of PAG oil. So a lot of times you had to take the compressor out, drain that oil out, and then refill the compressor with the correct oil for it to work. Same thing with the refrigeration systems. We had to get all of that old oil out of there and put in the new oil. Now, in the refrigeration systems, it wasn't always PAG oil. It was a lot of times PoE oil, polyoester oil. So that was the oil. Now, the catch is because there wasn't that chlorine molecule in the refrigerant, it, this refrigerant would not carry through the mineral oil. So the oil wouldn't be flowing through the system. And without a oiling system, the compressor would fail. So having to switch that out was very, very important. A lot of people didn't do that. They didn't follow that step. By switching over the refrigerant and not switching over the oil, they had an oiling issue and it would cause compressor failure. So making sure that not only we had the correct refrigerant, we also had the correct oil going with that. Now on the automotive side, they replaced the standard size fittings for the gauges with these quick connect adapters. So you had special adapters when you converted one over and all the new vehicles have these quick connect style adapters. You can still buy the adapter that goes from that quick connect to your gauge port, but it simply has these connections very similar to an air compressor that they snapped on. Once it snapped on, it locked, and you could then charge and recharge, pull a vacuum, whatever servicing you need to do. Now, this R134A refrigerant was not an ozone-depleting refrigerant, so it did not tear down the ozone layer. 
However, years later, we found out that R134A does have a GWP, which is global warming potential. Other countries call it a climate change potential, but in the US, we call it a global warming potential. So it says it has a potential to cause global warming. So now you're gonna be seeing this refrigerant be going away, and now they're gonna be bringing in some other refrigerant that's gonna be replacing this. And I'm sure over time, that will continue to happen. That refrigerant will go away and there'll be something else, and this is gonna be a continual part of what we do. And so we're just going to have to deal with that the best that we possibly can. So as we go through that, this right now is refrigerant has been so popular for such a very long time, and now you're gonna see this refrigerant going away and people are gonna start freaking out. I remember when we switched from R12 over to 134A, it was like the end of the world, the sky is falling, and now everybody has 134A is not thinking about it. Well, now this refrigerant is gonna be going away, the sky is gonna be falling again, and we're gonna to have to adapt to something else. But learning how to adapt, keeping your feelings to the side, learning how to adapt to that new refrigerant is going to be key. Do I have my feelings what refrigerant's gonna be best? Absolutely, does it matter? It does not matter. Ideally, you're gonna be prepared for the next thing. So on your EPA test, it's gonna talk about 134A, and 134A is an HFC, hydrofluorocarbon. Notice there's only one C, hydrofluorocarbon. HFC, hydrofluorocarbon. We still have the fluorine, but we only have a carbon. We don't have a chlorine molecule. So it doesn't have that chlorine molecule. It's not an ozone depleting, but it still has a high global warming potential, GWP. So this is the 134A that's also gonna be going away, the oil that specifically goes with this refrigerant, and this is just for the typically automotive systems and also some refrigeration equipment as well, you see these refrigerants being used. And the automotive side, we use the small cans. Those are the cans for the automotive side. Now, if you wanna take that test for the EPA for automotive, it's an open book test you can take at home anywhere. There is a catch when you buy these containers, there'll be two different types of valves on it. They have the automotive type valve, which this one has, and there's also the standard size valve that we had for refrigeration equipment that uses standard hose connections. I just like to buy adapters. So I have the adapter that takes my standard hose connections over to these quick connects, and I also have the adapters that take these automotive style connections over to a regular SAE connection for my hose. So those adapters can solve and overcome many problems. But that's the change where we went from our oil, or also called mineral oil, with our CFCs, chloral, fluorocarbon being the ozone depleter, and we replaced that with a non-ozone depleting refrigerant, HFC hydrofluorocarbon 134A with a different type of oil, a PAG oil or a polyester oil, and this refrigerant is now gonna be replaced because of a high global warming potential. The new refrigerants we're gonna talk about later, but this is just our first step. There's an entropy chart that's used with every refrigerant that shows exactly how many B2s of heat it's absorbing as it changes state from a liquid to vapor. And it also includes your pressures in here. So you can actually compare different refrigerants in a system to see how much heat they're pulling out. Now eventually I'm gonna be doing a video showing how that happens, I just haven't figured out how to transition and present that information yet, but I'm gonna post a link to two different videos on that chart and how that chart works. It's just gonna be an introductory, it's not that we're gonna be using that chart a lot, but it's gets you an understanding of appreciation of how many BTUs of that heat is being absorbed as 50% of the refrigerant boils, or as all the refrigerant boils, or as that refrigerant superheats. You can actually track how many BTUs of heat energy is being done with that, so you can compare the different refrigerants. So just because we have the two different refrigerants doesn't mean they're gonna be the same pressure or the same saturation temperature, or they're even going to be absorbing the same amount of heat. This is just for your refrigeration side and automotive side, let's also take a look next at our housing side.